Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Shane Mansfield. Uh, so I'm going to take over and talk a little bit about the, the mathematics, um, the mathematics behind photonic quantum computing. So I'm just going to share my slides. All right. And then I'll count on someone to tell me when they see something. Just Yeah, I can, sure slide, yeah I can see your slide, Shane. Yeah, I can see your Yeah. OK, super. <laughs> All right, so as we said, I'm gonna go a little bit into the details of the, the mathematics behind linear optical quantum computing. So um, don't worry, I'm gonna go you know, at a, at a, at a pace where, where it should be easy to follow along. Um, there'll be a few points during the presentation where it will be a bit interactive and there'll be some um, exercises for you to think about. So, uh, let's get started. Um, begin with a little bit about me, um, just to explain who I am and where I come from. Uh, so my role is Chief Research Officer at Condella, so coordinating the research and development efforts. I joined Condella in, in uh, 2020. Um, so, and, and at that time I, I arrived and there was a beautiful mature technology and I had this very exciting mission, which was to think of algorithms, think of protocols, um, and think of, in general, think of things that we could do with the, with the photons. So uh, that was my mission when I arrived at Condella and it was, it was fantastic. But of course I had a, had a life before Condella as well. So um, to give a bit about my background, I did my PhD in computer science at the University of Oxford. Oxford's very old university calls its PhDs DPhils. Uh, they claim that they have the right to do this because they started doing they started giving out these degrees before PhDs. So um, it's the doctorate. It's the same thing. Um, and then I had um, I had a little bit of time in a number of large. Um, the research labs in the UK. So I, I was um, junior research fellow as well at Oxford, and then I I moved to um, to Paris, where I worked with uh, had a I had a, an award from the Paris Foundation for Mathematical Sciences. Uh, later, I had a European um, project, so I led a, a project on at the time it was something called resource sensitive quantum computing, which comes a lot into what I do today still. Uh, so that was a, a Marie Curie fellowship, which I had at Sorbonne University, and um, and then I had uh, the nice uh, chance and opportunity to join Condela. So my expertise, um, I've worked a lot on the topic of quantum advantages, and particularly on the foundations of um, of quantum computing. And now, of course, uh, largely focus my efforts on on photonic things. Okay, so let me jump ahead. Uh, the goals of, of this class, um, what I'm going to present to you today. Um, so we're going to talk about the mathematical background behind linear optical quantum computing. Um, so the main kinds of object that we're going to talk about are, are unitary matrices, in fact. So that's, that's how we describe every, every operation. This maybe won't come as a surprise um, to, to those of you who work with quantum mechanics. Um, this, is, this is the natural way to describe evolutions in quantum mechanics, of course. But there'll be particular forms for, for, lin for linear optics, as we'll see. Um, we're going to understand something that's called boson sampling. So that's a very important task in in um, in quantum computing today. It's it's a it's a task that quantum computers, in particular photonic quantum computers, do naturally, but which is extremely hard for classical machines to to simulate. And so that's behind a lot of behind under the hood, we'll say, uh, for a lot of demonstrations of quantum advantage where, where we where we have some claims of quantum devices that outperform classical ones today and it's also very interesting to put it um, to put it into the mix when we're when we're building algorithms and applications as you'll see in later classes um, then we're going to work on building up um, an intuition of just why uh, computing with photons it becomes so complex uh, so quickly 
and there'd be an opportunity to, to to run through this and really kind of understand it in its details with a basic example, which is the HOM experiment, Hong Wu Mandel. Being the three, uh, being the three um, uh, authors that this is named after. At least one of them being South Korean, as I as I recall, actually. Okay, so moving on, we're going to start with the one of the basic building blocks of, of what we do in, in linear optics, and that is the beam splitter. So beam splitter, um, many, many of you have worked in physics labs or done undergraduate physics uh, experiments, may have come across these objects. Um, typically, we're talking about a block of glass um, and we send light onto it and there's a probability that it reflects or a probability that it transmits. So that's the basic um, that's the basic functioning of, of a beam splitter. So if we just think about the concrete object in itself, uh, in this image, the, the, the red line is, is your is our incident uh, light, could be laser light, for example. It's our incident light. And um, the green output, uh, that's that's the reflected light, and the blue output, that's transmitted light. So this is what happens. Um, depending on the reflectivity of the beam splitter, we're going to have different probabilities for transmission or, or reflection. So um, how we describe this, um, how we describe this mathematically is going to be in terms of uh, a, a, a unitary matrix, a transmission matrix, uh, which gives us the amplitudes for transmission or for reflection. And so the typical way to write the matrix is um, is what we see here. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think I can switch my... Oops. Just the pointer would be useful if I get it to work. I think the bottom side is Shane. Yep. Okay. I think I have it. Whoops. Okay. Oops. All right. Um, Okay, I'm sure that's working. In any case, all right, I think we'll manage without for now. Um, okay, so the typical way to describe this is in terms of a matrix. So uh, the inputs, if we were doing this uh, in optics and we were just talking about uh, light uh, as we describe it most generally, uh, we might look at um, the vector, the, called the Jones vector, um, in which we put uh, the electric field components. And we'll look at how these transform uh, unitarily. So there's some parameters in here, uh, R and T. R is, is going to end up as the reflection probability, and T is going to end up as the transmission probability. So we're going to have to impose a constraint that uh, reflection and transmission, what one or other one or other of these happens. So there, there needs to be an outcome. And essentially that's ensured by unitarity of the matrix. So uh, unitarity of the matrix is gonna make sure that, um, that uh, probabilities uh, are respected as, as a vector is evolved. That's um, the essential uh, feature of, of unitarity. And that's why unitary matrices are so important in quantum mechanics. There we go. So, um, uh, so the probability is going to have to do with the amplitude squared. So this is what comes from mechanics. And so, uh, um, sorry, yeah. So the, so the R squared will be the probability of transmission. Now, sometimes it can be useful um, to, to work with uh, different, um, different transfer variable transformations. So a classic thing that uh, we would do in a situation like this is we'd parameterize uh, variables R and T that have to satisfy a constraint. So R squared plus T squared equals one. This looks very much like the, the equation for a, for a circle. And so it's natural to start using trigonometric components. So we would often, we can always parameterize um, variables R and T that satisfy a constraint like this um, using sine and cos. 
So this is a quite a natural thing to do. So in fact, what we end up with as the most general um, as the most general form of unitary matrix that could describe a process like this of light being transmitted or reflected, the probabilities being preserved, uh, is this tau matrix. And so we have a lot of parameters in the tau matrix. Um, there's a global phase. Uh, typically, global phases in quantum mechanics, they disappear as soon as we make measurements. So that's interesting to have in there, um, maybe for completeness at this stage. It can also be interesting when we compose uh, different matrices. We, we can think about how they're... How, so the global phases suddenly become become uh, local phases, in fact, when we when we compose several of these objects. Then we have um, we have a phase, essentially one for each of the input legs and the, the output legs of a beam splitter. So what you have in this um, figure here in red and black, by the way, that's that's um, the Percival's representation of a beam splitter. We've talked about the concrete object and Percival is going to describe it as, as in the as in the figure with uh, in red and black here. An interesting thing to note there is that there are two input input wires. So we talked about a beam splitter as operating on a single input and splitting it into a transmitted and reflected wave. But in fact, you can see there could be two paths. So there's also the dark blue path uh, behind, which we didn't speak about, which can also transmit and reflect. It's just that um, the green wire is now transmission, where it was reflection before. And the light blue wire is reflection where it was transmission before. So we can have two input ports and we have two output ports. All right, so th that's the beam splitter. Um, and that's the, the most general way that, that we can write it down. So we have, um, we have these uh, phases, uh, um, uh, many phases that we can play with uh, that respect this in the most general form. And then um, a point that can be confusing when people first come to linear optics is that there are actually many different conventions for writing a, 50, a simple 50-50 beam splitter. Um, and so that has to do with just how we, what convention we choose for, for, for phases. So actually the, there are a list of matrices here and it's maybe an exercise for you to think about as you look at these, which ones actually constitutes a 50-50 beam splitter or not, as in which match the, the, general, the general pattern. Um, so I'll let you think about this for a moment, um, and we can go through. So the first one certainly matches. Um, so here we just uh, choose theta um choose theta to, to be pi over four we set the phi equals uh phi equals phi zero equals zero for example and you can see that with tri trivial phases we're, we're going to end up with we're going to end up with that matrix you can look through um, you'll also find that you can generate this one uh, so you'll notice there's a symmetry across the diagonal um this one if you think about it is not going to work out um, so why why is that not going to work out? Well, you can see that um, you have the 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 phase that's involved in the diagonal terms uh, should be the same. So that one doesn't work out. Uh, the next one does. So we have um, we have the kind of um, so the diagonals definitely uh, line up, and then across the diagonal. Okay, we have a minus one and a plus one, but that's okay because that's something that we can account for with the the um, the conjugate phases on those anti-diagonal terms. So the e to the i phi t, e to the minus i phi t, e to the i pi, e to the minus i pi would give us plus and minus one. And uh, for the last, uh, we'll see that uh, this one also does not work out uh, because if we because of the um, on the diagonal, we're going to be missing. Uh, we're going to be missing a minus if we try to match everything up. So this is an interesting exercise just to uh, you know test yourself on a few of these and see if you get the idea. All right. So moving on, these are the those are the beam splitter matrices. 
Um, and now we're going to talk about phase shifters. So phase shifters, the image on the left gives you an idea of what a phase shifter would look like in a lab. So again, it's just going to be a component that we pass uh, pass light through. It's typically in, in free space. Um, it's just a little object. We shine a laser through it and it adds, it adds a phase to the light as it passes through. Um, so we can talk about it as acting on two separate inputs if we like. Uh, this is interesting because we've already started to describe the beam splitter where we talked about there being two, two separate inputs. Um, in this case, it's going to act on one. Um, and it's going to act on one by, um, it's going to act on one again uh, by a matrix, but in this case, it's going to be a relatively trivial matrix. And it's going to look like this. So it's very close to identity. It doesn't do any swapping between the components. Now, that's what we expect because we have, uh, if we look at the diagram, we have um, two uh, light beams channels, um, which we call spatial modes, I suppose. We have two spatial modes and we don't have any interaction between them. So we don't expect to have any off diagonal terms in our tau matrix. On the bottom one, we're doing nothing. So we expect that um, the, the bottom right entry, this, this should just be a, a one, right? Nothing happens to that, uh, to that lower component. And on the top, as I said, we're adding a phase. So we get something that looks very close to an identity matrix, but we just have a, a phase on the, on the, on the, first, uh, on the first channel. So what do you have on the left resembles a little bit what you would see in a lab. And what you have on the right, this is how Percival descripts, uh, describes, this is how Percival depicts um, uh, a phase shifter. So those are the two basic components that we come back to time and time again in um, in linear optics. There are some other components that we could that we could talk about in linear optics um, operations that act on polarization. But uh, typically, we can do everything that's interesting for us uh, by trans transform. Typically, always, uh, we can do everything that's interesting for us by transforming uh, polarization degrees of freedom into spatial ones and just working with beam splitters and, and polarizers. And there's actually a practical reason for us to, to do this, too, is that uh, we like to work with our linear optical components printed on a, on a chip. And um, there's an advantage to working with polarization preserving um, operations on chip because it's much easier to, 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 to maintain this way. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about single photons. So we've talked about the components themselves, but we need to talk about what we input into our operations. And for us, as you'd have understood, we work a lot with single photons, so individual photons, that is, so individual quanta of light. And the natural way to describe individual photons or low photon numbers, discrete um, photon numbers that we're able to count, is with Fox states. So what we have here is, in fact, uh, a multi-mode Fox state. So um, the modes, if you, if you like, these are the the, the, the wires, the, the, the wave guides that we can put the photons into. Um, so you can see them labeled 0, 1, 2, and 3 here. And so what, what can happen is that we put uh, photons into any one of these modes, or we put several photons into, into any one of these modes. And so the, the Fox state description um, of this, it's, it's going to be, it's going to just tell us how many modes are in, or how many photons are in mode 0, how many photons are in mode 1, how many photons in mode two and how many in mode three. And so we have these uh, four ends, which describe to us, um, a, let's say, an input state of, of, uh, of single photons. Now we're talking about a quantum state, of course. So there are some properties that we have to satisfy. Um, so overall, we have to have a normalized state, which is to say that, um, you know, with probability one, it, it, we, we have something. Uh, which, so 
when we talk about um, when we talk about the states that we can have in our circuits, we need to describe them as linear combinations, um, convex combination, uh, convex affine combinations. I think is the correct word. So, um, or convex, um, well, complex convex combinations of um, of of these basic number states. So the, the general form of the state is this S. So we have a probability amplitude associated to each arrangement of, of photons. Okay, so there'll be uh, one probability associated with the state 0, 0, 0, 0, where there are no photons anywhere. There'll be another probability associated with uh, the state 1, 1, 1, 1, where we have one photon in every mode and for everything uh, in between and for states where we have two photons here and five photons in the, in the last mode etc and what we need to ensure for the quantum state to be well defined is just that these probability amplitudes um, well the the sum of their moduli squared uh, that's the modulus squared that gives us a probability for, for each one of those states the sum of all of those moduli squared adds to one just to make sure that uh, probability is respected. So with probability one, we have one of these states. And uh, for the individual probabilities of any given state, you just take the amplitude and you and you square it. And so this is, I mean, kind of st standard quantum mechanics, um, but it's even standard mechanics, right? So um, there's a uh, classical mechanics will give you this relationship between the amplitude of a wave and the, the and probability as well, uh, which which in classical mechanics you talk about as intensity. By the way, so just to make the connection for those who are more familiar with the classical realm. Uh, so there's another point that's kind of um, hidden behind what I'm showing you here but which is important to make explicit. And that is that in everything that we're doing here, we're supposing that the single photons of which we speak, that they're identical in all of their physical degrees of freedom, other than simply you know, deciding which spatial mode um, they're going to occupy. So in particular, we're talking about um, polarization uh, that's fixed across all of the photons and frequency or wavelength that's fixed for, for all of the photons. Now, there's a good reason for this. Um, it's that uh, it's that uh, photons that are indistinguishable will interfere in a way that's different to a bunch of completely distinguishable photons. And actually, we much prefer working with identical ones because we get uh, the interferences are far more interesting and eventually far more complex. So. Uh, just to point that out and make it explicit that that's what's going on behind the hood. All right, and then we get to we get to some combinatorics. And uh, this is a this is the start of kind of understanding the, com the complexity of what's going on. So we can now start to enumerate all of the states that we could have, all of those Fox states, those kind of number states. So we fix a constraint, um, and we say that we have n photons, a fixed number of photons, and we have m modes, again, a fixed number of uh, wires that you can put those, those photons into. And um, you can try to calculate how many different arrangements there are of the n photons and the n modes. And interestingly, it comes back to um, a kind of a high school math problem uh, that maybe some people have come across before. Um, it's 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 a fun problem called the the stars and bars problem. So in the stars and bars problem, just like with the photons and the modes, you're given a number of stars, you're given a number of bars, and you have to come up with different arrangements um, for for how you could how you could lay these out uh, from left to right. And you see, if you think about it, that this is actually very similar to, to what we're doing. So the bars are somehow, the, the, the sorry, let's start with the stars, the, the asterisks. So the stars, the, these are like our photons. 
and the bars uh, these these are like our dividers between modes if you like so um that's maybe just a trick to have in mind so that the bars are not going to be like the modes themselves but rather the where we put the divider where we where we say okay um now i'm passing on to the next mode and whatever photon appears is going to be in the next one and so for this, um, you can see that, in fact, the, the two problems are equivalent. So if you want to think of all the arrangements for n photons and n modes, it's equivalent to a stars and bars problem, where we have uh, n stars, but we have m minus 1 bars, right? So m minus 1, because the bars correspond to the, the barriers between the modes rather than the modes themselves. So you need just you need one less to be able to specify uh, m m modes. You need m minus one barriers, and so then you get to the combinatorics of it, and we have this uh, this figure, this this uh, this capital M figure that's going to crop up later again. So um, keep this in mind, um, and so you're going to choose. Um, n plus m minus one. So that's how many objects you have all together, how many stars or you know or bars, the set of, of all of them. And you're going to choose where to put those m minus one barriers, uh, the, the bars that are going to be our boundary between the modes. And so that's a that's a combinatorial expression with factorials that uh, that crop up here. And um you can wonder just how big this is and factorial you know maybe you have an intuition factorial is is uh factorial is gets gets large very fast so factorial will get large uh, faster than an exponential um and here's an interesting uh observation so if we fix the the number of modes to be twice uh, the number of photons, and that's a natural thing for us to do actually in photonics. So our usual way of representing qubits is with one photon over two modes. So we're often in a situation where we want to think of uh, having twice as many modes as, as photons. If we work in that case, uh, we can kind of do some approximations. So there are some uh, there's some appro standard approximations as you know you may be familiar with, and that could be fun to uh, run through the calculation yourselves. Um, for the factorial expressions, and you can kind of get out that um, in the limit for for large n, um, we end up with uh, four to the power of n. Uh, we end up approximating four to the power of n. So the number of different ways to put n photons and n modes grows like this. Um, so a, a comment on, on why that's particularly interesting to us, for example, is that th this gives us more different states with n photons than we would have qubit states with n qubits. So qubit states, um, they, they each qubit's gonna have two values. If you have n qubits, then you have two to the n uh, different different uh, different states that you that you could be in different multi qubit states. Whereas when we're working in the Fox space, uh, we have four to the n. So that that's uh, that's going to be a significantly larger value. That's Fox space choosing that we have uh, one photon for every two modes. Of course, if you allow different numbers of modes and photons, you can you can uh, you can be even higher. And so it's a very interesting point that the size of the Fox space is is very important. It's very consequent, and this is also an intuition that uh, we'll take with us when we go to talk about algorithms and and applications. And so um, often when we're when we're thinking about algorithms later on, we 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 have this intuition in mind that okay, we have this absolutely huge uh, space of, of, of states to play with and, and just how do we best manipulate that and sometimes it's kind of it, it's maybe an intuition to have in mind as well uh, we're going to get around to talking about what's difficult for classical to simulate um, where we reach this boundary between what uh, quantum systems do naturally and what classical systems are able to simulate and um, this explosion in the in the Fox space is, is somehow is somehow behind that as well. So it's good intuition to to hold on to at the size. Okay. 
So now we're going to look at evolving a basic Fox state, Fox state through a beam splitter. And so the Fox state is going to be, if, uh, to begin with, it's just going to be a, 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 an input of, of one photon. We're going to look at input on the mode A. Um, we're going to put nothing in on mode B. Um, and we're going to see what the probability amplitudes are going to be like for the output modes uh, C and D. So we choose a convention, uh, fixing the phases. Um, so when I say convention, by the way, just to be very clear, convention is not going to change anything about the actual empirical predictions. Um, so ultimately, we have uh, two different levels of everything that we describe in quantum mechanics. We talk about the amplitudes, and then we talk about the probabilities. The probabilities are the ones that are empirical. That's what we see in the lab. And so uh, you get those after squaring everything out and phases, phases disappear in this process. So um, the convention that we're going to take is this, this beam splitter with ones on the diagonal and eyes on the anti-diagonal. And we're going to start uh, with an input state A. So if you like, you could think of this as a vector, just one, zero. Um, so, so with uh, so, so we have a, 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 a we have a, or a vet or a fox state uh, also one comma zero, and um, and we apply the matrix to it. And so one zero, it's going to give us um, output amplitudes. Um, it's going to give us output amplitudes one, and i with a with a one over square root of two outside of both of these. So. Um, when we go to calculate the modulus squared of, of each of those probability amplitudes, we end up with uh, one half, right? So it's going to be one uh, over square root of two squared, so one over two, or it's going to be uh, it's going to be i over square root of two squared, uh, which uh, modulus squared, which is again going to be just one half. So that's just um a basic maybe calculation you can uh, run through it yourself to be sure that you're convinced and it, it shouldn't take long and that's what happens when we put a single photon into into a beam splitter now we can ask what happens it begins to get more interesting of course what happens when we put two photons at the input so when we have two photons we can do a little bit of calculation for this one uh, so we're going to put both of the photons in on mode A again. So that's uh, A, A1 and A2 here. And we're going to see what happens. Well, for each of them, we're just applying the same uh, unitary matrix, right? Each of them goes through the same physical component. And so it needs to be uh, evolved through the same matrix that describes that component. And so what you end up with is just twice the, the, the same expression. Uh, so the, the, the one over square root of two, uh, C plus I D. So this is what I was kind of describing in words on the previous slide. And so if we multiply this out, uh, the star here is a tensor product. If we multiply this out, um, uh, if we multiply this out, we end up with, um, a half as the factor on the outside. So whereas before it was one over square root of two. So we have a half as a, as the factor on the outside. Um, we have the Fox state where both photons emerge in mode uh, C. Let's, let me just jump to the previous slide so that we, um, we recall the, uh, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. So I just wanted to have the, the labels. Uh, so C is transmission and D is reflection, just to be clear about that. C is transmission, D is reflection. So basically we have the we have the, the possibility that um, both photons are transmitted. That's the two Cs going straight through. We have also a probability amplitude for both photons to be reflected. That's the two Ds. And then in between, we have these two terms uh, where one is transmitted and one is reflected. 
Now, when it comes to observing, as we said, we've indistinguishable photons. Um, if we observe a photon on mode C and a photon on mode D, uh, we're not going to be able to tell whether um, that's the, 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 the photons both being transmitted or the photons both being reflected. And so when it comes to looking at the, the probability for um, C and D for having a detection, detecting a photon on C and D, what we're going to do is sum the, the probabilities for both of those two events. So that's how we end up with 25% probability of transmission, 25% of reflect, of, uh, sorry, both transmitting, 25% of both reflecting, but we end up with 50% of, um, 50 of uh, a detection on, 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 on transmission and, and reflection. So, so far, that's kind of what we expect, right? It's a 50-50 beam splitter. It's completely what you would expect. If I put in a single photon, there's 50-50 probability of it going through or not. If I put in two photons, then it should be the same thing twice. Uh, modulo this uh, observation that um, there's something indistinguishable about the photons. So, you know, both being transmitted and both being reflected, I, uh, or sorry, one being transmitted and reflected or one being reflected and the other transmitted. I, I can't tell between them. So I just add those to get 50% probability for double detection. Okay, so, so far, so good. And then we get to this uh, much more curious state. Um, and so it's, it's what I get uh, when I put photon inputs at both A and B. Sorry, the text, I've made this confusing, but um, we, we're putting an input photon, as you can see. So the correct thing to look at is the diagram. So I'm putting in a photon on mode A. I'm putting in a photon on mode B. They're both going to reach the beam splitter at the same time. And now we're going to try to understand uh, what happens. So you might form an intuition about this. It's written on the slides, which will give the game away. But you might think about this yourself first and form an intuition for it, right? So I have. If I just take it one photon at a time, I should have 50-50 probability that it's transmitted or reflected. And when I put in two photons, you know, my my intuitions are I would expect, well, okay, both of them are going to be 50-50 transmitted or reflected. But this is not actually how the mathematics uh, works out. And this is quite interesting. So um, the state uh, that we that we end up with, um, it's going to have a it's going to have a cancellation basically in the amplitudes, um, and the cancellation uh, means that we remove um, at the level of probability amplitudes, we remove this probability of getting one photon on output mode C and one photon on output mode D. And so when we work out the, the squares of those amplitudes, they've, they've cancelled. We have interference at the level of the probability amplitudes. Um, so we get, we get zero probability amplitudes. So of course, when we square to the modulus, um, we also have probability zero. And, um, and it leaves only these possibilities of both photons being transmitted or both being reflected. And actually, I think if I look at the mathematical expressions, we've got the I think I need to do an update here because we uh, the minus isn't appearing. But um, so okay, I'll try to I'll, I'll make that clearer, and we can share the we can share the expression afterwards. So this one, this this uh, phenomenon, this is this is what's called the Hongu Mandel effect. That when we put a photon at the uh, incident, uh, two two photons incident in different channels on a beam splitter, uh, we have this um, interference phenomenon which doesn't allow you to get um, both photons emerging in different, in different modes just because of this uh, cancellation that we get for indistinguishable bosons. And so here's an experiment that we could do to actually measure the hong mandel effect. Uh, this was an interesting one because when we started playing with, um, when we started developing First of all, I'm playing with some basic examples. Um, you know, this was obviously one of the, the first um, phenomena that we were trying to reproduce. And it was quite nice because one of the, the founders of Condella, 
had worked on this during his thesis and we were able to go to his thesis and look at the experiment that he had done and we were able to try to reproduce numerically the results that he had achieved in the in the lab uh, some years before and it looked um, just like just like this in fact so the the physical setup that they actually built in the lab looks like looked like this um so it's the parcel diagram of course but um it's the arrangement that's important so we have a first beam splitter. We put two um, uh, put two photons in, in uh, one consecutively, right? So we put two photons in um, in the, the 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 first input mode of that beam splitter. We do nothing on the second input mode, so that's just um, there for completeness. And then they're coming consecutively, right? So there there are no interference effects. Uh, so each of them, it's going to be 50-50 sent um, through, transmitted, or um, reflected. So it'll end up in the upper or lower branch of this interferometer um, with 50-50 probability. And then on the upper branch, we add a delay. And so the delay is tuned to be long enough that it matches the, the time between the two consecutive photons. Then we have a second beam splitter, so it recombines um, the two different paths. And we can look at what happens um, at the output. Now, what's the what's the reason for, for this arrangement? Well, um, so we're able to, or Valerio actually, so the, one of the founders, what he was actually able to do in the lab, he was able to input uh, photons consecutively. What's going to happen is that um, some fraction of the time we have a photon, the first photon transmitted and the second, the, or, sorry, the first photon reflected and the second photon transmitted. So that's going to happen one quarter of the time. And when that does happen, the second, uh, sorry, the first photon uh, that's gone through first, it's going to go through the delay. Right? And the delay is going to mean that even though they were asynchronous arriving, um, the first one has gone through the delay, so it's been slowed down, and it, they're both going to arrive at the, the second beam splitter at the same time. Okay, both of the photons arriving at the beam splitter at the same time, that gives us this uh, setup for the Hamu Mandel effect. So when they both arrive at the beam splitter at the same time, there's zero probability to, for the detectors to click in both outputs. So what happens is either both photons go through the upper output or both photons go through the lower output. So one quarter of the time that happens. So if you run the experiment, uh, what you see is you, you can tune the delay. And when you get the delay just right, so that it matches the, the, the time between the two consecutive photons, then you get a, a dip in the coincident detections, so uh, having a detection on on both of the output modes, and that's exactly what you what you expect from the from the theory. So that was um, that's a that's a fun um, maybe lab experiment for people to do, but it's also a fun personal experiment for people to do numerically. Um, okay, and so we've talked about the basic effects or some some basic examples. Um, we could, of course, have like much more complex linear optical circuits. And so I think this is the first that we're showing in this presentation, uh, the one on the right. So this is also um, a linear optical circuit that we can draw in Percival. And so you can see the, the, the um, beam splitters and phase shifters here. So phase shifters in gray um, with a parameter phi attached to them. Uh, the beam splitters are where we get the, the convergence of the wires. Uh, we've drawn them like this incidentally is an interesting point to state so we started out talking about beam splitters as being you know usually maybe a block of a block of glass that's that's how you would see it if you go into um, an optics lab often when you're working uh, in in free space at least so when you're working with laser light passing through free space um actually when we're working on chip uh, we have waveguides that are engraved uh, into the into the chip or engraved or, or printed in different materials that our photons pass through and when it comes to implementing a beam splitter 
in fact how it looks is is you get the two you get two waveguides that uh, approach each other that come very close together that are parallel for a little while and then that diverge again and so these these are um, directional couplers we call them and um having them close enough means that you get some um you get some spillover of the 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 the, the quantum wave which gives you some probability for actually transmitting to the neighboring mode uh, um, or not so that's how they're implemented on chip and so th this particular way of um, of depicting things is a little closer to what's there on chip so there are different ways of depicting beam splitters and phase shifters uh, in Percival as well so that's just a, a slightly more complex um, linear optical circuit another thing that you'll note in the middle is that we have some uh, wires that swap over uh, and then you'll note, I mean, yeah, various things. So there's some sort of uh, symmetry in the in the diagram as well. But just as a first, I uh, commented as a first linear optical circuit, that's a little bit more complex. And so um, that's uh, that's interesting now to ask the more general question: How do we simulate single photons propagating through any given linear optical circuit? And so if you think about it, there, there could be two ways um, of going about this. And the way that people who maybe played a little bit with quantum mechanics before are likely to, to, to think of first, it's um, the step-by-step -step approach. So step-by-step -step is, is often how we treat um, qubit quantum circuits and logic gates. You start with a description of the input state and then you just go layer by layer. You look at okay, what's the first uh, what what's the first um, time step? So you divide divide the diagram into just time step by time step, and we say what are the first what's the first layer of of gates that uh, my state meets? And I apply the unitary matrices for those, and now I have a I have a new state. And then I look at what's the next layer of gates that my state meets, and I apply that matrix. And then I have a, a state that's been propagated through two layers, and I continue until I get to the end. So that would be the step-by-step -step approach. And another approach, which actually tends to be more, um, tends to be well, yeah, more interesting for us in the neuro optics, uh, particularly because it's um, much more computationally. Uh, tractable is working with circuit unit trees. So we can think of the circuit as a whole as being a unitary transformation. And so instead of just taking the state at the start, evolving it step by step by step and having an intermediate state at each stage, we actually just work at the level of the transformations. So let's forget for a moment what the input state was. We look at the circuit as a whole. Okay, it's got all of these uh, different components which are represented by matrices. What I can do is just multiply out, multiply all these matrices uh, together and work out what the unitary is that describes the entire circuit. So this is often advantageous to do. So these are two approaches. Go through these. So how would we do, how would we combine unitary matrices if we, if we see uh, a more complex circuit? Um, well, a simple case is where we just have um, operations one after the other. Uh, so that's, you know, the U1 and U2, the, these could be beam splitters if you like, or they could be a string of beam splitters, uh, one of these max ender type interferometers. Um, whatever they are, um, if, you, if you have them uh, one after the other in sequence, so here U2 follows um, U1 or the application of U2, uh, follows the application of U1, if you like. Um, the overall unitary described by this, well, you just get it by matrix multiplication. So that's a straightforward one. Um, and then we come around to what happens when you have a, a unitary on a single mode or when you compose things in, in parallel. Um, so if I have a unit reacting on a single mode and I want to add add a new mode beneath it, um, well, I just need a bigger matrix to describe all of those modes. Um, I should have no interaction between them. So I should have nothing on, on the diagonals in my bigger matrix. So I should have some zeros or blocks of zero. And I should have um, 
I mean, in this case, I should have identity in the lower part. So that's um, a one if it's a single mode or if it was a block of modes, it would be a, it would be a, a block, an identity block in the bottom right. And on the top, I have a unitary uh, matrix. In this case, um, a one mode unitary matrix or just a complex uh, phase. Um, and so I, I just have uh, a U1. And in, in general, that's how it works. So if I compose things in parallel, I'm just going to get these block uh, matrices with uh, the first in the top, the, 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 the first unitary in the top left and the, the second unitary in the, in the bottom right. Um, and then we can see what happens if we kind of have uh, modes uh, overlapping in, in interesting ways, right? So here we could think about a beam splitter between mode zero and one and a beam splitter between modes one and two. Um, and so you need to describe each of them. So the first step would be to describe each of them as, as acting on, on three modes, right? So we use the trick from the previous slide. Um, so U1, for example, um, is gonna be it, it's this uh, it's this second matrix, and so you can see that we've got a block on the top left, which is uh, U one itself. It's the two by two matrix, and we have a block on the bottom right, which just represents doing doing nothing, doing identity on the on the third mode. So this matrix it just trivially kind of describes U um, one. But is acting on three three modes now, where it's trivial on the third, and you do the same with U two, and then you have these two three by three matrices, which you can you can just multiply out again. So that's where you kind of have a, a non-trivial combination of um, of uh, um, sequential composition and and um, and parallel composition. Okay, so. Uh, now let's build a, a Max Zender interferometer. So this is an object that crops up a lot in physics. Uh, it's a pair of beam splitters in sequence. Uh, so you have two branches in the middle between these beam splitters, and on one of them, uh, you're going to place a, a phase shift. So that's uh, that's known as a Max Zender interferometer. And so we can look at what the transfer matrix for this one is. Um, and so uh, if we work it out, um, we can just go step by step. So what would we do? We'd combine the matrix for a beam splitter. We'd combine, okay, the, so the matrix for a phase over two modes, right? So that's just going to be, um, that's just going to be a phase and the, so it's going to look like an identity matrix, if you recall. Uh, phase in the top left and one in the one in the bottom right because we're doing nothing on the lower mode and we're applying the phase of the first one, and then we're going to have the the beam splitter matrix again. So we can we can work it out. Uh, we can work it out uh, what the what the matrix looks like, and so we get the tau below if we do the multiplications. So um, that's something that you can um, try to uh, scribble through yourself so that you you're completely convinced. Um, just using the individual matrices and the rules that we've given. And then interestingly, we find that the Max Ender interferometer, it's, um, it, it's equivalent to, to this thing that we have on the right. And what we have on the right is a beam splitter, but with uh, which is not uh, assumed to be 50-50, right? So note the, the theta, um, the theta phi over two here. So that's telling us the, the transmissivity. And then we have um, phases phi one and phi two in the output. And so if you look at the, if you calculate the, the transmission matrices or the transfer matrices for both of these, you'll um, you'll see that these that these match up. Okay. Now we're gonna come around to um, the, uh, we're going to start to touch on this general problem of, of boson sampling, which I flagged up at the beginning as being a particularly interesting task for us. Um, particularly interesting, because, as, as I was saying, because it's something that um, quantum systems do naturally, but that ends up being very difficult to, to, to simulate classically. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, 
the, the kind of the, the problem that you should have in mind is okay i'm gonna i give you a unitary it's some arbitrary unitary or if you like i could give you some some linear optical circuit an arbitrary one and you you work out what the unitary is using the rules that we've just given but um you want to make some predictions about it uh, so that's what physics is all about uh, <laughs> we uh, we want to know the in initial conditions and then be able to make predictions for for how things are going to, going to play out um, so that's our that's our game as physicists and if we try to do it in this uh, situation the question would be well you know how do i just uh, work out how do i you know work out the output probability distribution of of um, of states at the output so we could be a little bit more precise about this. So we could we could uh, break the question down into kind of different layers. Uh, one thing is just to know the exact output amplitudes. Another question would be to know the output probabilities. These are subtly different. Or uh, another one would be to just um, mimic the behavior of the circuit. So maybe bypass calculating the probabilities and just be able to um, sample to 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 give me an output um, which eventually would correspond to the correct probability distribution if I if I built up a huge frequency of these samples but just give me a sample that's um, going to be indistinguishable from how the from how the quantum system behaves okay so that's the the, the problem that we have in mind so, um, to be clear and as I was saying, um, these kinds of tasks, uh, the sampling kind of task in particular, um, these are behind many of the claims of uh, quantum supremacy or quantum computational advantage, as it's known sometimes. So you're trying to simulate uh, boson sampling. You're trying to mimic um, how this um, quantum circuit is 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 uh, spitting out uh, responses, spitting, giving giving us output states. And so we can go through these claims. Um, the, the the first uh, was from Google. This was really a landmark moment. It was big news for quantum computing at the time. Um, they did an experiment with 53 qubits. This was on a, a superconducting processor. So it's not a photonic experiment. But the task that they implemented was a sampling task. And it was very much inspired by this boson sampling problem that I've, I've just been describing. So it was really kind of a way of, they came up with a way of translating that boson sampling problem into um, uh, superconduct circuits for superconducting processors. So that was the first one. It was, it was big news. Um, and then we've had several since. So um, there are two of them came from USTC in China. Um, and so these ones concern Gaussian boson sampling. So they are photonic. They don't work with individual photons as we do. They they work with um, they work with laser light, uh, squeezed states of laser light. Um, and so it's uh, I mean the 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 first one was equivalent of seventy six photons. Uh, the second one, sorry, the second one was superconducting as well. Yeah, so USTC is working on uh, working on all the platforms. So the first one was a photonic one. The second one was a superconducting one, which uh, went a little higher than um, than what Google had had. So 56 instead of 53. Um, and then there was another very nice experiment uh, from 22, where Xanadu used their Borealis chip. Again, it's Gaussian boson sampling, so not with individual photons, but it's somehow the, the their experiment was somehow an equivalent of um, uh, well, uh, you pick, but something something in between 125 and 219 um, photons, so depending on the coincidences you get out, um, in, in uh, 216 modes. Okay, um, so, so, so another point that we, we can't uh, pass up when we talk about these uh, these supremacy or quantum computational advantage experiments is that um, there's a game of cat and mouse going on, which is very fascinating to watch. And um, it, it's wonderful in a way. It's actually leading to advances in um, what we're capable of doing with in quantum technology and what we're able to do with classical technology for simulating 
quantum systems. And so every time someone puts out an experiment, you have teams of um, teams of computer scientists who who are trying to improve their methods of classical simulation so that they can spoof these results so they can achieve results that are that are very close to them. And so that's the the interesting game of cat and mouse. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll let you <laughs> let you dive into into those papers at your leisure. It's it's really very interesting to look at. For what it's worth, um, I think we're just at we're at a very interesting moment in quantum computing where really we are scratching at the limits of what classical uh, machines are capable of of simulating. Um, the precise boundary is a little bit wavy. Um, so it, it depends on, of course, it depends on the machines that we're, the classical machines that we're using, but it depends also a lot on the approximation methods that we're using. How, also, how we approximate, how we, how we evaluate. So a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, all right. So but let's talk about the problem itself as a, as a, as a, as a kind of a classical problem now that we've set up boson sampling. So I'm going to make the distinction between weak and strong simulation. So weak simulation is what I've been calling, um, is what I've been calling sampling. So with weak simulation, what you want to do is generate individual samples according to some underlying probability distribution. But I'm not going to ask you to give me the probability distribution itself. So I, I'm just going to ask you to, to give me samples that agree with it. So it's kind of like a less constraining task. And indeed, it's possible to do, it's possible to do a little bit better on weak simulation or to, 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 to simulate um, higher numbers of photons in higher numbers of modes than it would be with strong simulation. So an example um, for what we're talking about uh, with sampling, um, here's a sample distribution, uh, probability distribution. Um, so we have four, uh, four events and we give them probabilities 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4. And we can do a little bit of uh, numerics to see what happens. So. If we start to sample, um, you know, across these four events, according to these uh, probabilities, uh, we can see how it looks with a low number of samples. So with, with just five samples, um, you can, okay, you, you can, it's, so these are just numerical simulation. You can see what um, an estimated distribution would be if you run, um, if you run this experiment, just, uh, pro program your program your laptop to to spit out things according to this distribution for you. Uh, you, you can read what's happened here in the in the first estimated distribution. Um, so you've taken five samples. So you've got one of them for the second event, and you've you've gotten um, four of them for the for the third event, and the, the first and, and fourth events just didn't crop up. All right, so that's um, that's what happens when you have five samples. Uh, when you have 10 samples, you can still kind of read what's happened. So I've twice gotten the first event, twice the second, three times the third, three times the fourth. Um, so that's with low numbers. But then as I start to take more and more samples, uh, eventually the estimated distribution, it gets a lot closer to, 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 to the, the distribution of actually the, re the real underlying distribution. So you can see by the time we've come down to 100,000 samples, um, we are to a very high precision at this stage. Um, so up to, you know, a third, the third decimal place, we're getting the right, uh, we're getting the right probabilities here. So you can measure how close um, the estimated distribution is to the real one. There are some measures that you can put on probability distributions to, to see how close they are. And uh, this uh, TVD trace variation distance is a, is a common one. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just some numerics maybe to give you the intuition with uh, with sampling and how eventually sampling should um, should converge to the to the right distribution, but uh, the problem is a bit different in itself. So as I was saying, we have these different levels um, of uh, simulation, 
Um, and so now we come around to strong simulation. And so strong simulation can mean um, well, can mean a few different things. Um, so we're going beyond sampling now. We we want uh, actual you know probabilities. Um, and so the the weakest thing we could ask is to directly calculate the probability of a given output state. So let's say you know I I know that my input state is one zero, and I want to calculate what's the uh, probability at, at the output of one zero again or something else zero one if you like but just give me the probability of one given output state um a stronger thing is to a, a stronger um uh kind of simulation would allow me to calculate the probability amplitude of a single output state so we know this is stronger because if i have the amplitude I can just use it to calculate the probability, right? I think it's modulus squared, but there's more information in the amplitude. So um, it's 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 complex. So I have, I have more information in there. It, it contains the phase information, which when I make an observation disappears, but nevertheless, if I just want to know the output state um, at a circuit before I measure it, um, probability amplitude can be can be important. And the last one is to directly calculate the probability amplitudes of all the possible output states. Um, and so that that's like um, that can give me the, the probability distribution, the overall probability distribution, of course. So um, all of these calculate more than, than just the, the observed empirical behavior to bear in mind. That would the observed empirical behavior would be the probability distribution. So all of these are kind of stronger, stronger than that when I'm talking about probability amplitudes. Or, sorry, the second, the second two. The first one is just the probability. Of course, that's what I see empirically. So perfect boson sampling algorithms. There have been a few of them. Um, Clifford and Clifford uh, came up with kind of the 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 flagship one. Uh, so they had two papers, 2017, 2020, and uh, they worked on on, uh, uh, on just on the boson sampling problem. And they got something with a complexity n uh, to, um, two to the power of n. And then we have um, we have formulae which give us um, which calculate all of the output amplitudes. So that's not sampling, but actually really giving you all of the output amplitudes. Um, and uh, there are two kind of classic ones: uh, Riser from 1963 and Glynn, which is more more recent. And so you can see the complexities for these. And then um, from Condela. Uh, uh, Nicolas Hortel, um, uh, who's my PhD student, uh, he worked on an algorithm for strong simulation of linear optical processes, which um, which came along in in twenty twenty one, which is actually implemented in Percival. So if you if you're working with Percival and you use the SLOS backend S L O S, that's um, simulation of linear optical process. Uh, um, uh, Strong linear optical simulation, yes, loss. So uh, that that's what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So those are the complexities. So I'm conscious that I uh, I've talked uh, slowly, so I'm running out of time. So I, I'm gonna uh, run through rapidly instead of uh, delaying. Uh, we could just talk about the practical complexity of of these algorithms. So these are state of the art algorithms, and we can ask, you know, up to how many photons are these valid? So on the left, we're talking about the sampling problem. So that's Clifford and Clifford um, is the state of the art there. And how high can I, you know, for how many photons and modes can I run Clifford and Clifford on a modern computer? The answer is I can get up to about 80 photons if I just want to calculate a single sample. It's just a single sample. If I want something like um, a sample um, at kind of kilohertz rate, then I'm I'm only able to go up to about 25 to 30 photons. And actually, I think when we made this approximation, um, uh, this was a, this was uh, Jean was assuming uh, classical hardware, which is even beyond what exists today. So I mean, really, these are these are limits. And then for strong simulation, uh, where we really try to get all the probability amplitudes, um, we have these these graphs, uh, which um, somehow they 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 allow us different amounts of memory, um, and so the black line was, um, I think a, we yeah the black line was something huge. I mean, we were assuming that we were allowed maybe a petabyte of of uh, of memory, 
And this is really the boundary um, at which the the you know you just hit the expansional wall and you you can't calculate anymore. So I mean here for example you can see maybe you know about fifteen photons in in say forty modes. That's just like the absolute absolute limits of uh, some fantastical classical hardware which doesn't even exist today maybe. And so probably what you can achieve on your laptop is closer to this to this blue curve. Uh, when you evaluate it so what you can get in your laptop is maybe something like uh, you know 12 photons in, in up to 20 modes something like this for strong simulation so that's to say that these, these are relatively small numbers of photons and modes and already if you try to do the if you try to use the state of the art simulation methods you're you're just uh, hitting a brick wall and so all of that uh, all of that happens because um the mathematics behind it uh, tell you that when you try to calculate the output state for a given unitary, um, it's, it's, it's actually equivalent to computing uh, a function of the unitary matrix uh, known as the permanent. So in particular, if you put the input state with a, with a one photon in each of the modes, you're just calculating a, a permanent of, the, of that matrix. Permanent is very like the determinant uh, is just if you look in the formula, you don't have the alternating um, plus and minus one signs. And so this is known to be uh, to be computationally hard. It's, it's a sharp P hard problem it was proved to be so in the in the in the 70s by Leslie Valiant. And um, that that's essentially where the, the power comes from. Um, so there's an exercise here, but I'm gonna, you know, uh, skip ahead because uh, I'm I'm really killing the time. So, but it's it remains an exercise here for you to 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 work through. Um, and I presume we're able to share the slides with you afterwards, so you actually get some time to think about this. It's good to go through the exercises. That's how you appropriate and are sure that you understand the problems. So uh, that's just how you should go through calculating the permanent of a given matrix. Um, then we said that, okay, if I put all the input states, one, 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 like a, a single photon in each of the input modes, um, I just calculate the, the permanent of the of the matrix to see what the probability amplitude of getting um, that out again is. If I, if I have a different input and output states, it's also going to come down to calculating a permanent, but not the permanent of the matrix itself, the permanent of a new matrix which I generate from the original, um, just by uh, taking some repeated rows and some repeated columns, um, and so you can you can convince yourself of that as well by going through the exercise. But I'm going to jump forward because I'm so slow. Uh, so that's an exercise for you to play with, and then uh, we can go to. Um, of the, the 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 generalization. So if you, you can try to think a little bit about what algorithms um, could allow you to 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 generate you know, all of the permutations and then work out all of the all of the different per permanents associated with uh, different inputs and output states. Um, so here uh, here again is an exercise to think about it, but also with a tip for the for the right algorithm. And then um, final points, which I'll go through rather quickly. It's um, just thinking the other way around, um, going from uh, unitary matrices to to circuits, which is also in, which is also something that's possible to do, right? So we've talked about starting with the circuits, multiplying out all the unitaries uh, to get one big unitary, so circuit to unitary. But you can also go from a unitary to a circuit as well. This is uh, fascinating um tra translation to make and it was due to um Reck, Zeidinger, Bernstein and Bertani originally and there have been many variations of it since. Uh, you take an n by n unitary matrix and you can actually decompose it into into an arrangement of beam splitters and phase shifters that will implement exactly that unitary for you. Um, it's a remarkable result and um uh, skip to the next slide where it's maybe e easier to explain how this comes about um, with a square arrangement in this case. Um, so we know that uh, a beam splitter, I can choose the parameters of a, of a beam splitter to achieve any um, SU2 matrix, so any kind of a special unitary two by two matrix. 
And from that uh, observation, I could start with any unitary and I could go looking at kind of, um, I could go looking at, uh, t t you know, um, take two by two, two by two blocks of it and try to zero some, some elements. So um, I can use a beam splitter to, to basically um, zero one element at a time. And you can see, I start with a unitary matrix. I'm just applying um, uh, a beam splitter on the outside. Of it. And each time I apply a beam splitter, it's with the goal of, I choose the parameters, the, the reflectivity and the, and the phase so that it just zeroes one of those components. And so bit by bit, I kind of zero everything. Um, I do it on the lower triangle in, in, this, in this particular algorithm. By unitarity, if I zero everything on the lower triangle, everything in the upper triangle is zeroed as well. And so I'm left with something that's almost an identity. Uh, it's just I have these diagonal terms which have phases in them. And so at the very end, I'm just going to do a, a layer of phase shifters. And so that's what you see in this um, in the linear optical circuit on the left. Uh, so I have a, a, a layer of, of phase shifters at the end, which just allow me to um, deal with those phases on the diagonal. So that allows me to turn any uh, unitary matrix uh, into an identity. So it's like uh, basically implementing the inverse of that matrix. And if I want, I just kind of you know invert everything, uh, which will get me back to the unitary I'm interested in to begin with. Uh, so it's really a lot of fun. It's a remarkable thing to do about unitary transformations. So just bear in mind that any unitary can actually be realized by beam splitters and phase shifters. Um, fascinating. Um, and uh, there's some trivial cases uh, that I'll let you read through afterwards. I'll finally mention something that's implemented in the in in Percival. It's um, it's a graphical language called the Love Calculus, linear optical uh, with vacuum states is what the V stands for, um, and it allows us to reason about linear optical circuits without necessarily going through all of the algebra, or the, all of the matrices and all of the multiplications and so on. Um, so it's it's a completely formal language, so it's proved to be sound and to be complete. So if you see an identity in the love calculus, uh, you find a pattern. Uh, so let's say here what we've got is the we've got the the rewriting uh, fragment, a rewriting system of the love calculus, uh, which allows us to simplify linear optical circuits. So anytime I see, um, let's say, I mean, let's look, look down at the end. Anytime I see something that looks like a, a Max Ender interferometer, um, I can simplify it to just uh, one beam splitter uh, and, and three phase shifters uh, with, you know, with some formula for the parameters. And that's something that I'm allowed to do anytime I see it. And I don't need to check the maths. It's all been checked and formally verified. And in fact, if you take um, this system of, of rewrites, so every time I see a pattern on the left of one of the rewrite rules, I apply the rule to go to the right. Um, this actually converges on th this, this, uh, this converges strongly um, to a normalized form of the linear optical circuits. So no matter what what uh, pattern I choose first, or you know which order I choose to make my simplifications, if I keep applying uh, rules as long as they're available to me, um, I'm going to end up with a simple normalized um, form. So it's always going to find the simplest form of circuit. This is remarkable as well because it's something that doesn't exist with qubit circuits, but it does exist with uh, linear optical ones. So uh, this is yeah. Um, really a, a, a this was a fantastic discovery we came across it this was like one of the things i've been most excited about in my scientific career so uh, there's a whole paper about this where you can find out more about it genuinely fascinating um and there's even a follow-up paper where we use this remarkable fact that you you have um, just a simple set of rules that allow you to simplify any linear optical circuit we use that to actually get simplification of qubit circuits as well um, and, and it's and we got a, a first ever, which was a complete um, equational theory of qubit circuits from it. So the photonic way of thinking is very powerful, even for you know um, qubits as well. Uh, I guess is the message I want to get across. So um, there's another uh, point is that we could 
we can introduce time. And um, so this is something that I'm going to le leave to you to, to think about. Um, it's, it's how you do a, a Hongu Mandel type setup with uh, with the time delay, which we've talked about during the during the during the presentation. And so I, I'll finish on the conclusion slides. Um, we can do modeling of linear optical circuits with two simple components. So we've talked about beam splitters and phase shifters. You can essentially build up everything from those. I did say there was uh, polarization components as well, but you can always transform polarization degree of freedom into a spatial one. And in practice, that's that's what we tend to do anyway when we work with linear optics on chip. Um, we've seen that any circuit, it's equivalent to a unitary transformation and vice versa. So any unitary transformation can also be equivalent to a, a circuit. Um, we talked about boson sampling. So that's the task of simulating uh, from a uh, simulating a sample from a linear optical circuit. Um, it's very hard to simulate. So um, in complexity theoretic terms, it's sharp p hard. Um, that that is that is a tough class. And um, in practical terms, uh, we've kind of seen where the state of the art algorithms um, can get us. And there doesn't really be, seem to be much room for improvement there. Um, places where there may be room to, to, to push a little further with approximate uh, sampling. But for exact sampling, we're really at the limits. Uh, so we can get up to maybe you know around thirty photons, I, I guess, for sampling, and 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 here that that's uh, that's assuming you know as I say some fantastical um, classical computing uh, resources. Um, so it's relatively small if you think about it for for something so complex, and then. Um, uh, very briefly at the end, I've mentioned about the, the graphical language, the love calculus. Um, for this one, you know, you should dive into the paper if you want to learn, learn more. There's some really beautiful mathematics behind that one as well. Okay, um, so I've, I've, I'm sorry that I've, I've run over time. I uh, didn't manage this. I didn't manage my time well. I couldn't see the time on the screen. But uh, anyway, hopefully that's, uh, um, hopefully that's uh, some good information. All right, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Shane. Uh, so it's already like 14 minutes over five. So do you think you can have some time for Q&A or should I just gather the, all the questionnaires and deliver it to you so you can later like, uh, provide me the answers? Uh, I'm I'm happy to to take questions, but it's it's more for uh, it's, it's more for the audience. <laughs> 네, 질문 있으시면 한두 가지 정도만 해 주시고요. 아니면은 저희 나중에 저희 양자 정보 연구 지원 센터로 질문 주시면은 그거 취합해서 어, 또 여쭤보고 답 전달해 드릴 수 있도록 그렇게 할까 합니다. 제인, uh, can you read the, the chat room? There's one question. Uh, yes, um, it's the question 915 about the Hongu Mandel effect. Um, right, uh, so, so the question is, um, it, about the Hongu Mandel effect. Uh, so we have, um, Ah, okay, kind of. So the question is if two photons enter one port of the Max Zender interferometer. Photons randomly choose either the upper or lower path for each individual photon. So that's that's true. Two two photons um, enter through the same port. They see a first beam splitter. Then for each of those, it's 50-50 that they go to the upper or the lower path. Um, but where you get Hong um, it's it's actually when you recombine them. And um is when you recombine them. So if you, so as you know, with the Max Ender ex experiment, um, I mean, uh, uh, you can tune the phase on one of the branches so that the, um, so that the the the, the outputs um, vary, right? So you can you can choose the phase so that everything gets transmitted, and everything or everything gets reflected, and so. Um, 
yeah, so you do, you still do have a visibility, um, you still do have a visibility phenomenon with Max Ender. So it's it's not quite Hongu Mandel, uh, the Max Ender interferometer. I, I hope I understand the question correctly, but so for me, it's try, kind of trying to make the link between Hongu Mandel and and um, and Max Ender. But two photons entering on the first beam splitter. Uh, here, that's just 50-50 probability for each of them that they go to the upper and lower path. So for the first beam splitter in itself, there's no Hongo Mandel effect, right? For Hongo Mandel, you need you need to have one photon entering through the top and the bottom. For the second beam splitter, then it may be the case that you um, you you have uh, photons entering. So if you can match their phases, then you'll get indeed Hongo Mandel on the on the on the second one in the cases where they've gone through different branches. One more question. Um, okay, yes, okay. so here it's um, in the case of two photons input at B um, is 50 50 in um in in oh is this what happens in in reality in in the in in the lab? um or is it assumed in simulation so actually it's it's what happens in the ideal case if you follow the mathematics um uh two photon two photon input on uh, hang on so two photon input on b um it's going to be 50 50 theoretically and if i look at it in the lab it's going to be also very close to to 50 50 so this is not just an assumption in in simulations it's something that we can actually um that we can actually verify and and check in the lab as well uh, of course every time you do an experiment in the lab you have some you know you you have some experimental imperfections um so you know, you can, you can take it into account things like uh, not having perfect 50-50 uh, reflectivity could be could be a case with components or, you know, you could have some uh, de detector issues. Um, you know, there are always various imperfections to, to think about and take into account in labs, but um, yeah, both simulation and, and, and empirical matchup in all of the cases that we talk about. Um, I have a very simple question. I'd like to ask uh, something um, about the slide at the beginning part. It, um, mm -hmm. Can you show me the slide with the uh, diagram including um, beam splitters labeled A, B, C, D? Yeah. OK, so I'm just getting this up. Before you go further. Oops, have I gone too far? Are we here or did, was it a later slide? Um, I think that a little bit later slide. Yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah, this I one, guess. this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering um, um, in the diagram, maybe left one and the bottom one should be um, C and D respectively, because um, if uh, considering your beam splitter transfer matrix, I think um, maybe C and D should be incoming wave, incoming things. And uh, yeah. Oh, so um, yeah, that's um, okay. So you're wondering whether C and D, the, the, these modes, these these could be inputs. So it would be a question of um, they they could in principle uh, be a question of how you how you read the components. Um, a curious thing about. Um, about unitaries that the whole point of unitaries is that they can be inverted and uh we have physical components like beam splitters as well we can uh, we can run photons through them in one direction or or through the other direction um and so you'd actually get uh, the the um the the adjoint um the con con conjugate transpose uh, matrix unitary matrix if you run photons 
as inputs on on C and D and took A, A and B as the outputs. From here, I, I, I was just reading the the diagram kind of from the bottom left to the top right. So um, so that uh, so that the A and B and in, as indicated with the arrows that would, I would would think of the A and B as the as the inputs and C and D as the outputs. Um, but so yeah, if if you ran it the other way around, um, the matrix itself it would just be um, would be the conjugate transpose, which would be um, yeah. I mean, you you you'd get just a different phase on the on the uh, your minus on the. Uh, on the anti-diagonal terms, yeah. So again, it, it's it's just um, uh, the convention I've chosen. I, I think is that is that a, is that a, an explanation, or if I um, have I covered the question? I'm not sure to have understood perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for your explanation. Yeah, my my question was okay. uh, really simple things. Um, I think that. On the left hand side, um, there will be a vector a and b, and on the right hand side, there will be a um, tra um, transfer matrix times the vector c and d. So I was under just. Ah, I see. Okay, so yeah. on the left hand side, I'm choosing as input. Um, I'm choosing as input a pho photon on a. And no input on B. So my input vector, um, it, it's so my input vector is A. And then, having applied the the the, the unitary matrix, um, I I end up with um, I end up with uh, this this vector in terms of C and D. So it has an amplitude for C and an amplitude for D. So if you like, um, I could have written um, B on the left hand side, but just with a coefficient zero. So if if you like the uh, I mean maybe a more complete uh, mathematical description it would have been a plus you know one a because I that's I with certainty that's where I want to put my photon plus zero b because I I with certainty want to avoid putting a photon. Okay. 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 Thanks for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. So this um, the the arrow that I have here that's that's just um, af that's. Um, to denote the the application of the of the the unitary matrix. Yeah, th thanks for the question. That that helps, I think, to make things cl clearer. Hopefully. All right. Uh, thank you, Shane. I think it's time to wrap it up. So, 오늘 참석해 주신 여러분 감사드리고요. 어 내일 또 3시부터 또 다음 세션 강의 이어서 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 